The next level of diversity going a step higher is species diversity. This is usually what we think of when we think of biodiversity, is how many different types of X, Y, and Z are there. Well, what's a species to begin with? Uh, it's a group of organisms that can reproduce with one another and they make offspring with one another, but those offspring have to be viable. They have to be fertile, meaning they have to be able to reproduce themselves. So for example, uh, here we have horse and this is a donkey. If you breed them, you get a mule. A mule, kind of like, you know, a blend really of the two. A mule is not a species. Yes, um, you know, they were made from something, but they can't reproduce. Uh, you can't take a mule and a mule, breed them together, and they make babies. Uh, essentially, nature has prevented that from happening. Nature has present, prevented that mule from being able to reproduce, usually because it has to do with number of chromosomes. Uh, lions and tigers, you can breed them and make a liger, but that liger is not a species. That liger cannot reproduce. So we wouldn't consider that a species. Regardless, so when we're talking about species diversity, just keep in mind we're not talking about all these crazy hybrids you can make. It's things that are in the wild that can breed and reproduce and make offspring that reproduce as well. Now we have millions of species, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but millions of them. How do we keep track of them? You know, we have names for them like a black bear or a Siberian tiger, but we have so many languages around the world and so many different names for organisms around the world as well. So how can we classify them in a universal way, in a global way, so that if I'm talking about this specific bird, someone in Japan can talk about that bird and we're talking about the same thing. And we can do that with a species classification. You've probably heard of the classification when thinking about humans. Uh, humans are homo sapiens. So this classification that maybe you've seen at some point in your life was developed by a scientist Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus created the idea of a classification used not just for animals, but for plants uh, and even bacteria. And it's used worldwide. Uh, it's used uh, in scientific papers. It's used in you know, popular magazines. So he created this classification going all the way from you know, life, so everything, to a species. And it's used to name organisms, but also to group organisms that are similar to one another. Now this binomial nomenclature, here I have shown for humans. Uh, humans, as I mentioned before, are Homo sapiens. Homo is the genus we are in. Sapiens is the specific species we are. We are actually the only organisms in um, genus in the Homo genus. Homo neanderthalus, or the Neanderthals, were also in the Homo uh, genus, but have since gone extinct. It's very important that you know this classification, not of humans per se, but of this. So life, not really a classification. Domain. So domain is the largest classification. This contains the most number of organisms. In the case of humans, we're in eukarya. But again, this you don't need to know. I'm not going to ask you, you know, what kingdom are we in or what order are we in. So we go from domain down to kingdom. You may have learned about the five kingdoms at some point in your life. As for animals, uh, plants, fungi, we have protists, and then previously we had bacteria. There's some classifications going on, but you've probably heard of those before. Us as humans, we're in Animalia. Then we go to phylum, class, order, and family, and then finally what makes up the species name being the genus and species. Now a lot of these words probably mean nothing to you. So one way that I remember this probably since, I don't know, second or third grade, and I still remember it, is I do kind of a mnemonic. So I use the D as, let's see, let's write it here. Deer, 
use this K for King. We use this P for Philip. I'm going to use this C for class. Oh, whoops, no. For, sorry, it stands for class. For came. O for over. F for four. G for green. And S for spaghetti. As you can tell, something made up uh, in elementary school. But it's it's stuck, so I guess guess it worked. Uh, so essentially, if you can remember the saying, Dear King Philip came over for green spaghetti, that gives you the first letter. You got the D, K, P, C, O, F, G, S. So at least remembering that order, because you'll be on the test, you'll be given those words. Um, no, so you will have those words given to you. You just need to know what order to put them in. So you don't have to use that mnemonic. I use it. It helps me. But knowing that domain being the biggest, it has the most number of organisms in it, and the species is just one organism. Once you go all the way through this classification, there will be one organism left. I'm going to give you another example. Again, you don't need to know the specifics, but kind of just demonstrating how this classification works. So the domain level, here you can see all sorts of organisms from you know, mushrooms and you know, starfish to dolphins, and we're trying to get down to this black bear. At the kingdom, you know, we're just looking at animals, so we're getting rid of the plants and everything. Chordata are things with backbones. So these are all things with backbones. Mammalia, these are mammals, including us. So now we're trimming it down to mammals. All right, carnivores, which humans are not in. We're only looking at carnivores. Then we have our um, general bears, then our true bears. And then finally, within the Ursus genus, we have Ursus americanus, which is the American black bear. Again, here's that genus name, Ursus. You can see that here. And then Americanus, that would be the species name. I can also say the species name is Ursus Americanus. Just know Americanus is species, Ursus is genus. You put them together to create that species name. And this Ursus Americanus is recognized everywhere around the world. This Latin name is used everywhere. This classification is used everywhere. So on Earth, we have about 1.74 million species identified. So we could name 1.74 million species. I shouldn't say name. Not all of them have names yet. But that's a lot of species. There are scientists who study all of these. And that could be you one day. One day you could be the person who discovers the 1,740,001 species. Of these species, so you see a couple of different you know, uh, graphs going on here. So it's this one right here you want to focus on. This is showing all of those species. As you can see, um, that insects rule the world. Over half of those nearly 2 million species are insects. Yeah, so they, they're everywhere. They outnumber, you know, other animals, they outnumber plants, they outnumber vertebrates or things with a backbone. They're, they're way far ahead of us. We estimate that in the world, we probably have about 9 million species in total. So we have a lot left to discover. A lot of them are in remote places of the earth that we can't access yet, or they're too small for us to find, or they are so uh, shy, so to speak, that they're harder to find. You can see, if you're curious, you can look at the breakdown of those insects, most of them being beetles and butterflies. Uh, and within our plants, uh, most of them being flowering plants, which is what uh, most of the plants outside are. Now, how do we measure species diversity, though? You know, if you're a wildlife manager or if you're a government trying to give money to help an ecosystem, like, what's, what's the goal? Like, how many species do you want? And so we have a couple metrics for measuring species diversity. 
The first one is species richness. This is just simply the number of species there are. So if I go out into the forest and I'm looking at different trees, maybe my plant species richness is five. There are five different species of trees there. Species evenness is the measure of relative abundance. So do I have one of this tree or do I have a hundred of this tree? This tree is there, but how many do I have? Now usually we're looking at many different species. So do I have tons of species A and not so much as species B. And as someone who is trying to preserve an ecosystem, this is actually incredibly important to calculate and figure out so that you have an idea of how your ecosystem is doing. So here I give you an example. Let's say you're a wildlife, wildlife manager and you have two forests that you need to oversee. And one of them you wanna spend a lot of money on to get it healthier and you have to choose. So here, my two forests, and I have daisies, dandelions, and buttercups inside this forest. So the species richness for both of these forests is the same. Each forest has daisies, dandelions, and buttercups. So in this case, the species richness is three within both of these forests. Now that in and of itself, okay, well, they're the same. Ah, they're the same. They must be both like great forests. But you know that's not true, just looking at the numbers. The evenness is different between these two. Forest one is more even. The numbers are around, you know, each other. Whereas in forest two, buttercups, you know, take over 90% of this forest. So 90% are buttercups and the rest is, you know, these other species. So it's not very even at all. So if I'm a wildlife manager, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to forest too. Maybe I'm going to take out some of these buttercups and I'll go and plant more of these daisies and dandelions to make the ecosystem more even. Evenness is important because organisms, you know, if you, if you only had buttercups, that'll attract organisms that like buttercups and nothing else. Well, what about the organisms that like daisies and dandelions? So it's important to keep ecosystems even, or at least return them to the level of evenness they once were.